Hey, good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. What happened to Dave and Siddharth and Kanan? Will they be joining us? Did they join the previous class? So Dave, Kanan, and Siddharth joined. Okay. Good morning, good morning. Okay. Okay, let's begin. Uh, can I ask uh, Prince to lead us in prayer, please, this morning? Yeah. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you. In this morning, Lord, we come before you, Lord, uh, as we're going to learn uh, this subject, Lord, help us to learn and also um, give us the wisdom and knowledge that we can uh, learn well and apply in our work, Lord. Thank you. I pray, pray for all the students and the man. Thank you. In this time, I just pray. Um. Okay. Uh, is my audio clear? Can you hear me clearly? Yes? Yes, it's clear, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Okay, so last week we looked at the uh, great need of this there. Uh, we looked at the spiritual condition of, or the, I'm sorry, we looked at the physical condition of the children uh, in uh, Jerusalem, those the very poor were left behind after uh, you know the others were taken as captive and we see that Jeremiah was left along with them and uh, the children because of no food they were just painting and dying in the streets and their parents were not doing anything much about it they're not in a position to do anything much uh, about it and so we see Jeremiah crying out to God and telling the people also to do something and cry out to uh, and we saw that you know the condition of the children in Jerusalem was quite similar to the you know there's the physical need but we looked at this at the spiritual need of children in certain parts of the world today are quite similar to what um, you know children of Jerusalem faced children of Jerusalem are uh, starving for physical food but today we see children in our world starving uh, for spiritual uh, food okay. And we said that, uh, uh, that mm -hmm. the children, they know God, but they don't have a personal relationship uh, with them, with Him. They have a form of godliness, but denying its uh, power. And uh, there is a tremendous need that has to be met to uh, actually minister to the children, uh, not just praying for them as uh, Jeremiah prayed, uh, but to meet that uh, there is, you know, there is a need, and that need has to be met, not just by prayer, but uh, you know, we need people to take and feed the children with the bread of life that is God's word, um, and uh, we need someone, uh, and we need people who teach them uh, the word of God in its entirety, in its truth, uh, uh, with the revelations in a deeper a way in a way that children can understand. So we need to take uh, uh, the bread of life, that is the word of God, to feed the uh, children. And then we looked at uh, probably four things a teacher can uh, have, how a teacher can have a great impact on a child's life. And the four things we said is uh, when uh, a teacher is well prepared and um, you know, prepares a lesson well, has a good lesson plan, has uh, effective uh, teaching methods. Um, they're going to actually trigger or, or cause the young ones uh, to think through uh, and to challenge them to uh, act upon what they have learned in their own uh, ways, in the, the ways they are most comfortable doing. Okay. We also see that the teacher is one who uh, treats the, the young ones or treats the children as uh, somebody who is uh, able and fit to understand uh, God's word, the truth in God's word, the revelation. Uh, treat them like ind intelligent individuals, not somebody who we can just go and say anything or do anything with and just come back. And also to understand that they are intelligent individuals who can respond 
uh, cooperately, which means get them to uh, respond to what has been taught in the ways of uh, applying uh, what they have learned. Okay? And also a teacher will, who makes a great impact in the lives of children, uh, children uh, is one who is loving, godly, and who is uh, you know, not just concerned in going and teaching the class because they are being fostered, but also one who is willing to share their lives with the young ones, their own uh, experience with God, uh, their own um, relationship with God. Uh, I think we learn this in first in second Timothy we are learning, right? You know, we need to know, uh, are we sharing uh, uh, our, what we have experienced with God, what the, uh, the, the food that we are receiving for God in terms of revelation. You know, are we sharing it with uh, others? And so, you know, it's important that we share our life, our testimony, the revelations, the truths that we receive, our experience of God with young ones, because it's actually, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, the global um, uh, 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 online survey which is conducted among teens, uh, uh, it, it's it's seen that you know teens uh, receive more not just by teachers who teach them just teachers who teach them but it's through their uh, their personal experience in prayer okay their personal experience in prayer so people uh, teenagers will uh, experience God in a more closer way in a more intimate way will know God have a relationship with him when we pray for them and they receive personal and answers personally in their own lives to for the prayers that we have prayed, or they will see God at work, they will see signs, miracles, and wonders. And then even when we share about our own personal lives and what God is doing in our lives, what God has done, you know, that would challenge them, that would uh, uh, help them, okay? So a teacher also who uh, makes a great impact in the lives of children, uh, when uh, they are interested not in just teaching the lesson that has been given to them uh, or teaching them biblical truths, but they are also concerned with the overall development of the uh, child. Okay, uh, what they're going through, their challenges, their difficulties, just praying for them uh, just helps them. Okay, then we looked at teaching as a divine call. Um, you know, and we, uh, we looked at in the ministry offices uh, that God has appointed, uh, which we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, uh, we see that God gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And all of them, whether it's an evangelist, a pro pro prophet, uh, uh, a preacher, uh, or, or a teacher, they're all use for the equipping of the saints and basically saints means believers here for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of uh, Christ. And so we saw that teaching children, though it's not a glamorous role, no one can see you, uh, no one appreciates you, no one uh, you know uh, applauses you for what you have done, claps for what you have done. It's quietly done, it's hidden, but God sees he rewards and we know the children are precious to him, uh, he cares for them, and so your role as a teacher is very, very important. And having said that, it's also important that you prepare well, that you know your children, understand their developmental needs, understand their learning styles, their, their intelligence uh, in the way, intelligences in the way that they learn, and uh, you know, choose appropriate activities so that and cater to their learning styles, their intelligences, and their way of uh, learning. And then we looked at the difference between a preacher and a teacher. A teacher is basically not just giving them information, but looking for responses, looking for ways in which they have understood, and also seeing that they apply it and uh, helping them apply and learn from uh, uh, you know, what uh, apply what they have learned in class. Okay. Then we looked at the duties of a um, uh, teacher uh, in the, uh, and we compare that to the ministry of the Old Testament priest. So in the ministry of the Old Testament priest, we find the qualifications uh, for a teacher of God's word. Now today we look at uh, uh, the qualifications of a teacher. Okay. 
I'll just present that. Okay. What is uh, the qualifications of a uh, teacher? Okay. Now we look at, uh, at uh, when we look at the duties, uh, we look at the ministry of the Old Testament piece, and uh, we were able to find the qualifications of the teacher of God's word. So we saw that a priest had to be from the tribe of Levi or uh, the family of Aaron. Uh, if not, uh, you know, they would not be able to serve. And so hence we see what is a qualification for a teacher who teaches or ministers to children is that a teacher must be the member of the family of God, uh, someone who is, uh, you know, has accepted Jesus as their person, say they received forgiveness of their sins, somebody who knows that they have been forgiven and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, and they know that they are born of the Spirit, uh, they are a new creature, uh, you know, if they don't have this qualification or they do it for themselves, they don't have this assurance, then they cannot teach the uh, Word of God. Of course, you know, anyone can teach the Word of God, but they are not effective uh, teachers. So, uh, every teacher who is teaching uh, children must ask themselves this question, am I saved? Am I born again? And am I, am I a member of God's own uh, family? And we look at in the Old Testament priests uh, that the priests needed to consecrate the entire life. Um, and we see that uh, no priest uh, could consecrate himself for less than a lifetime. The entire life had to be consecrated in the service of God, in the temple, in the tabernacle. Uh, and that was the uh, requirement. It was a requirement for a lifetime. And there was and consecrating his entire life. We see that there's nothing he could uh, hold back. Okay. And uh, we see as a living a consecrated life as a priest, the priest was completely under God's law or God's uh, orders, under his commands. They had to do exactly what God had told them to. Uh, or is telling them to tell, communicate to uh, the people uh, what he wants them to teach and how he wants to uh, uh, wants the people to be guided and how he wants them to live. So the priests are to live a consecrated life, the entire lifetime, uh, and they are completely under God's orders. Okay? So if a teacher has to be effective. Uh, and have the favor of God, the blessing of God uh, on what they are doing or their, min their ministry or their teaching, then they have to give themselves completely, they consecrate their lives completely as the peace. And when this is done, you know, uh, God will teach them, God will minister to them, God will give them the revelations, the ideas, God will give them creative ideas on how to uh, you know, engage the children in games or activities, how to uh, prepare the lesson, how to teach the lesson. Uh, God will just uh, empower them through the Holy uh, Spirit. Okay. We also see that, uh, you know, um, the Old Testament priests were consecrated and anointed. Okay. Um, uh, and when they were consecrated, it was a ceremony that was done both through oil. Uh, the anointed oil which they would anoint on the priest and also the blood. Now it is not that uh, you know the priest will cut himself or they cut the uh, the person uh, who is consecrating themselves. It is just they make the animal sacrifice, which is uh, you know uh, making an atonement for their sins that they have committed. And uh, so the consecration ceremony is basically the oil and the blood. And uh, the blood is sprinkled uh, both on the altar and it's also sprinkled on the uh, on the person. Uh, and the oil is, uh, you know, a, a foreshadow of typifying uh, the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, basically anointing 
uh, we're talking about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about the word anointing, it's talking about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So in this consecration ceremony, there's both oil and blood. Blood is for the atonement, for the sacrifice, for their sins, cleansing, purification of their, uh, their life. And uh, the oil is anointing, which is talking about the presence and the power of uh, God who's going to be manifest through of them almost will be use them to speak his words, use them to stand in his place uh, and to do all the rituals, sacrifices and also teach the uh, people. Okay, so we see that uh, uh, God was anointing them. Okay, and uh, so a teacher also has to be both cleansing the blood of the lamb that is, you know, they receive forgiveness of sins, they are born again. And also they, uh, you know, they receive the anointing when they consecrate themselves, they receive the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to minister to children, to, uh, to feed them, to speak to them, to answer their questions and to know the areas of challenges and speak into their life, to make decrees and declarations that will, you know, will bring them into the destiny and the purposes for which uh, God has uh, uh, you know, call them or purpose them uh, for. Okay, um, we see that the priest was giving himself to the Lord for a definite task, and also a teacher must consecrate their lives for the same reason uh, for teaching and ministering to uh, children. Uh, when a, a priest would uh, consecrate his entire life, live live under the orders of God, uh, fulfill what God has uh, for them. Uh, has portion for them, has purpose for them, uh, we see that they experience the blessing of God upon their life and upon their uh, ministry. Okay, So also with teachers, every teacher who teaches, uh, when their lives are, they consecrate their lives, they see that they receive the favor, the anointing and the blessing of God. And we see spiritual results will follow. We see the transformation of the lives of children they themselves accepting Jesus as their personal Savior, walking in uh, love and in the light of God, uh, and doing uh, fulfilling the purposes of God for which they are uh, called. Okay, and we see that the Holy Spirit will transform the lives of the children, work in their lives, and uh, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit will be very manifest, very powerfully felt in our um, midst. Okay. Now, to minister to children or to minister to anybody, uh, there needs to be a messenger and there has to be a message and there has to be method, okay? So there is a messenger, there is a message and there is a method uh, which is required to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of course, this is, uh, all this thing is done through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And without the empowering of the Holy Spirit, we can't do anything. The empowering of the Holy Spirit is very, very um, essential. Okay. So we look at the messenger first. Uh, what are some of the qualifications or the characteristics? We, the first one is they have to grow and mature in their walk with um, God. Uh, a teacher must grow and mature in their walk with God. They must uh, grow in their understanding of the things of God, grow in uh, uh, the Word of God, in their understanding of the Word of God, grow stronger in their prayer life, and grow deeper in the things of God, uh, uh, in the gifts of God, flow in the gifts of God, and just, just desire more of God because, you know, when we desire more of God, uh, there will be an outflow of the power of God that is seen in our life and through our um, ministry, okay? So, uh, uh, if anyone has to teach, whether teach or preach or, you know, do anything with regard to the Word of God, then they must be themselves faithful students of the Word. That means before we preach, we teach, we need to be faithful in preparing, in studying, uh, in getting a deeper insight, deeper revelation, deeper knowledge of what the passage, the verse uh, is saying or what God is trying to communicate. Uh, 
and uh, you know uh, we have a great perfect dependable and flawless teacher uh, that is the holy spirit uh, he is infallible that means he is perfect uh, he is somebody we can depend on we can go to who will give us the answers who will reveal the truth um, who will remind us everything that jesus has spoken and thought and who is somebody who is flawless flawless means somebody who is without any fault or mistake you can never make a mistake you can never make an error and, and that is the holy spirit who is there as our teacher who will teach us um, all things okay um, uh, second timothy chapter 2 verse 15 can one of you read that please second timothy chapter 2 verse 15 Second Timothy chapter two verse fifteen. Fifteen. No one wants to read. Yeah, please read, Prince. Thank you. Captain Prince, I thought you were going to read. If nobody wants to read, then I'll read. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of of truth okay so it says here that we need to do our best um, ourselves okay to um, uh, to you know as one of truth a workman who does not need to be ashamed but correctly handles the word of truth so we need to study uh, the word of god to show ourselves approved unto uh, god and we also need to correctly divide the word of uh, truth. Okay, so before we teach or preach the truth of God, we ourselves need to study it uh, so that we can show ourselves approved by God. And when we study God's word, you know, those who seek Him will find Him, will receive fresh new revelations, a better understanding, and we will be able to teach children or people about the word of God. The second thing a messenger must do is they must spend quality time with the Lord. Uh, you know, not just get busy bodies in um, doing ministry, uh, doing a whole lot of things, uh, but also spending quality time with the Lord because uh, our ministry is an overflow of our time with God. So if you want to see signs, miracles and wonders, if you want to see lives changed, if you want to see children accepting God as a person, Savior, if you want to see children interested in learning about God, uh, their interest in, a keen interest in growing in the things of God, it means that we need to spend quality time with God. When we spend quality time with God, we will see there's an overflow uh, of that power and that presence which will be released. And, uh, you know, no one will say no to that. Everyone will just soak in the presence of God, will just receive it, and the Holy Spirit will work in God's life, in their lives. Okay, uh, if you look at Jesus' life, we see that Jesus himself spent quality time with the Lord. We read that, you know, in Luke, he got up very early in the morning, you know, um, uh, before sunrise, or he spent the entire night, you know, on the mountain just talking to God. So we know that Jesus did not have to do it because he was free God. Uh, but uh, we see his need of uh, his intimacy, his dependence on the uh, Father. Okay, even as he was fully man, we see him depending, and he sets us a model and he shows us a pattern uh, that you know uh, that 
uh, that you know we need to spend uh, time with God in prayer. And uh, because of his uh, time he spent uh, in prayer with God the Father, we see a powerful overflow of uh, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit manifested even as he spent the day, you know, just for the teaching people, uh, when he taught people, they were not bored. Uh, they just spent the entire day just sitting and listening to him, even not even uh, being conscious of the time where they're going to get the food from. Uh, and we also see, you know, multitudes came to him and it says Jesus healed them all. You know, multitudes came to him. That means people, the disciples were not able to count. And it just says, says Jesus healed them all. Okay, irrespective of what their sickness or disease was, he healed them all. Now, where did uh, all of this power come from? It was not just because he was God. He did not operate in, uh, you know, in the the omnipotent or omniscient or omnipresent. Um, that is the very characteristic of God. But he kind of laid it aside. He took upon the role of, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was fully human in that sense. But he did it to the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus says we can do more than what he has done in terms of signs, miracles, and wonders because he's going to the Father. And Jesus knew that we could do it because he was human like us and he did all of the miracles being a human, not being fully deity or being fully God. And he knew that we, he did it to the power of the Holy Spirit. And the same Holy Spirit power is available to us. But why does Jesus... Uh, you know, there's so many more miracles and why are we not able to do it? It's because of the quality time he spent with the uh, father, okay? So, you know, we think that, you know, only adults need to see signs, miracles and wonders. No, it's even children uh, because, you know, the global statistics uh, that was online survey that was done showed that, you know, uh, when teenagers, uh, you know, 13 to 19 years old, uh, they say what really impacts them uh, to consider a religious uh, belief or to accept God uh, is, uh, you know, when they see answers to prayer. That is, uh, you know, the highest percentage uh, that was uh, given by uh, these things. So, you know, uh, even children, when they, when they experience the power of God through science, miracles, wonders, answered prayers, you know, uh, they would not uh, be in a position to say no to God. They would just leave their lives, submit, and they will also flow in the gifts of the Spirit. So you are instrumental in leading them to even be mighty in God uh, at a very young age. And for all of this, it's important that we spend quality time with the Lord, whether we are pastors, evangelists, uh, prophets, apostles, uh, even if it is children's church teachers, we need to spend quality time with God because our ministry is an overflow of our time with uh, God. Okay. So the next um, qualification of a messenger is um, uh, we read in First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-two. The verses on your screen. Can one of you read it, please? One of you read it. The worship. He who called you is. He who called you is faithful, and he will do for you. Thank you. So here we see. Next that, time, no? Yeah. Thank you. So here we see that uh, you know we need to do our part and uh, our part in being faithful and committed. Uh, you know, uh, being faithful in preparing our lessons, teaching. Uh, pray for the children and God will do his part in equipping uh, us or the teachers with creative skills, talents, uh, uh, the ideas necessary to transform the lives of children and he will raise a generation for his kingdom and for his glory. As God's word says, he who began a good work in us uh, will be faithful to um, complete it. Okay. Um, so we need to be faithful. The next one is a teacher must have uh, definite uh, objectives. Okay, a teacher must have uh, definite objectives. Now, when a builder is planning to build 
a building, he will not just automatically you know think about it the previous night or uh, a week and uh, you know next week or next month he will just start on it and start building. No, he first has to have a plan in place, a drawing, a sketch, uh, the building, a plan. Then he must gather up his resources, uh, find. Uh, Finances, money, uh, materials, uh, the people to elect a building. Uh, and when he has all of this in place, that is when uh, uh, the work of the building can actually start. So, in the same way, a teacher must have uh, definite objectives. Um, okay, and what are these definite objectives that uh, each child must be considered as one in whom certain things are to be accomplished? And uh, the teacher's priority is to teach the word of God in such a way that every boy and every girl or every child, uh, first of all, uh, you know, will be convicted of their need for Christ and accept him as their personal uh, savior. Okay, so this is um, the first uh, thing that, you know, uh, the the, the, the child, the first need is, uh, the first preparation that the teacher will convict it is that every child would have to accept Jesus as their own personal savior. Uh, we read this in Romans 3.23. Can one of you read Romans 3.23, please? Romans 3.23. If any of you know, know it by heart, it will say it. Romans 3.23. Anyone knows it by heart? For all have yeah. Yeah. sinned and fallen short of the all glory have. of Okay. Uh, John 1.12. Can one of you read John 1.12 please? But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become to, to, be. to those who become in his name. Thank you. So here we see that uh, you know he is uh, those who believe in him gives them the right to become children of God. And uh, we also see in Romans three twenty that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and uh, it's uh, God's desire that all men be saved and come to the knowledge uh, of Christ. Um, Jesus. Okay, so the first thing that everyone will be convicted of his need for Christ and um, uh, as their personal savior. The second thing is that they will be taught to live a life by faith, the life of holiness and um, service that they may know from the word what is right and what is um, wrong. And we can read. Um, can one of you read um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 17, please? The second definite objective is that a teacher must make sure that, uh, you know, um, the children be taught to live a life of faith, a life of holiness and service that they may know from God's word what is right and wrong. So can one of you in that context read Colossians chapter 3 verse 17? Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says, and whatever you do, whatever in, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Okay. And the third um, definite objective that a teacher should have is that the children will know how to claim Christ's power and uh, to live and serve God. So they will uh, serve God. Uh, and they will live their lives claiming God's power, the power that he has given 
uh, them uh, the spiritual inheritance uh, that he has given them that we read in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, the spiritual blessings that he has blessed them with. Uh, so they would know all of this and they would not just do it, but they would receive it for their lives, they would claim it for their lives, and they would live and um, serve God. Uh, so in that context, can one of you read uh, Romans chapter 6 verse 14? Romans chapter 6 verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under, you are not under law, but under grace. Yes, so here, thank you, Dave. So, you know, uh, they would know that uh, they, uh, you know, sin has no more power, authority over their lives. They're no longer slaves of sin. Uh, the law of sin, which is the, uh, the rule or the dominion of sin, is no longer dominating their bodies. Uh, because they are living by grace when they have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal sins. They will know all of these truths and they will claim it and they will live their um, lives. Okay. So the teacher's objective is to give every child an opportunity to receive Christ, uh, to lead them into this assurance of salvation and uh, to build them up in the things of um, God. Okay. And we uh, see that a teacher also, uh, you know, should teach each class, a uh, child in their class. Every teacher should see each child in their class as uh, a soul that is saved or unsaved. That means, look at them if uh, if they are uh, accepted Jesus as their person, Savior, you know, uh, you are happy, then you just get them to grow more in the things of God. But if they're not accepted Jesus as their personal savior, you need to know which children have not. And you need to pray for them. Also use opportunities in which you can um, lead them uh, to have a personal experience with God. So the teacher must make every effort uh, to win every child to Christ. Uh, Satan will attempt to get us to put this off or not see this as a priority. Sometimes a priority which is to finish our lesson. Uh, but this is also very important and we cannot lose a child and we cannot lose a person because if we do, we lose them for the rest of uh, eternity, okay? Um, and we know that God has given us or assigned uh, believers the task of uh, winning the lost souls. Uh, can one of you read Mark chapter 16 verse 15 please? Mark chapter 16 verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yes, so we see that God has assigned every believer to go into all the world to preach the gospel uh, of salvation uh, to every creature. Okay, Romans uh, chapter 10 verse 14 and 15 says, uh, Paul tells uh, the rights of the church at Rome, he says, How then uh, shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So how will children know uh, or uh, God, how will they believe in God if there's no one, you know, uh, who is, uh, you know, there to preach to them, to teach them, uh, but, you know, it says here, the beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, uh, who bring glad tidings of good things. Okay? We see that even in the early church, um, you know, uh, the apostles, the disciples, the believers, they all went from house to house, uh, sharing uh, uh, about Jesus and winning those who are unsaved. And uh, Jesus promised uh, to make us Fishers of men, if we follow him, we read this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, when he said to them, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Okay. Uh, with regard to salvation of souls, we also know that God loves the world. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, and he does not want anyone to perish, 
uh, he has done everything that is needed uh, uh, for the work of salvation to be complete, um, for our sins to be paid, our debts to be paid, for us to be free from the law of sin, the rule or dominion of sin in our body that was dominating our body, um, you know, before um, uh, we knew Christ. He's also uh, put an end to the power of sin, the power of death, and he has paralyzed and nullified totally um, a Satan. He has won the victory with Satan. He has given us, um, uh, and he shares that victory with us. Okay, And uh, all, God has done everything Jesus has fulfilled and uh, made a perfect sacrifice that was needed for the atonement, for the cover-up, uh, or for the removal of our sins, nothing more needs to be done. Uh, but we see that um, you know uh, millions are still perishing. Uh, you know every year, uh, that's because we are not preaching or we are not fulfilling the mandate or taking the good news and sharing it with the uh, world. Okay, and people are dying against the will of God. As it's we read in first Peter, second Peter chapter three, uh, verse nine, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Okay, so it's God's good, pleasing, and perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We also know from this verse in 2 Peter 3, 9 that uh, he does not want anyone to perish but come to repentance. But we know min millions are dying each day, thousands are dying each day without uh, knowing uh, Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It's because we are not uh, you know, taking that responsibility or seeing the importance of a life saved or a soul um, saved. Okay? So, you know, if we value a life, if we value a soul, uh, you know, then we will take up this responsibility seriously. So what is the value of a soul or what is the value of a life? Uh, to that person, uh, whether he knows it or not, his soul is worth more than the whole world, okay? Uh, to God, a soul is worth all the love and all the sacrifice he has bestowed uh, for our salvation. So we know that even if there's even one person on the earth was a sinner, Christ would have come and died for that one person. Okay? Like we read in uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Okay? And uh, so a soul is, uh, you know, very precious in God's sight, whether it's a child or an adult or an old person, elderly person. Everyone's soul is very precious or life is very precious to God. Um, he doesn't want anyone to perish. Okay. Uh, in heaven, a soul is uh, uh, so valuable that there is great joy or there's great rejoicing when one soul comes into the kingdom, enters into the family of uh, uh, God. As we read in Luke uh, chapter 15, verse 10, it says, um, uh, Jesus says, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Okay? And uh, those who win souls, uh, Actually, when they when we are you know engaged in constantly sharing about salvation with people, we are concerned about the lost souls. We cry out to God. Uh, it shows how much we value uh, the sacrifice of Jesus, the sacrifice of our Savior, what He's done on the cross. It shows us the importance um, uh, and how precious each life is in the eyes of. God, or how valuable and precious each life is to uh, God. Like Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins soul is wise. Or he who wins souls is wise. Okay? Is wise, sir. Now, read that again. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. So we should be like Paul, who had this uh, motto or had this focus in, as he mentions in First Corinthians chapter nine, verse twenty-two, 
And he says, um, look the weak, I become as a weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things for all men, that, uh, that I might by all means save some. Okay? So Paul says he gets down to the level of where people are uh, so that he can address to their, their friends where they are, the situation where they are, so that he can share the gospel and, and by doing so he can uh, save some people. Okay? So as we carefully consider the Bible teaching uh, on soul winning and apply these truths to ourselves, you know, we will find that there is a burden from God that will impel us, that will force us, that will push us uh, to win souls for uh, Christ. Now there is this Sunday school teacher named um, Edward Kimbell, okay, Edward Kimbell, uh, who went down to a shoe store uh, in Boston, okay, uh, because one of his um, Sunday school students uh, was working there, uh, uh, you know, and uh, he wanted to actually uh, share about salvation. I think he was burdened. He was, uh, uh, you know, they had a stirring in his heart uh, to share the gospel uh, with this uh, child in his class who was working in this uh, shoe store. So we see Edward Kimball, you know, who goes down to the shoe store um, and, uh, you know, uh, he's um, a little hesitant. He doesn't know how to uh, go about doing it. Uh, he tells us that his courage failed. Uh, he walked back and forth in front of the, uh, you know, the shoe store, uh, gathering some courage, mustering some courage to go in and ask uh, this young boy who was working in the shoe store, who was a Sunday school student, to accept uh, uh, Jesus. But he eventually does that. He goes, and uh, you know, the little that he realizes that. Uh, you know, this student that he's sharing about salvation who will accept Jesus Christ will one day become a great evangelist. And this young person was none other than D.L. Moody. Okay, D.L. Moody who became one of the greatest evangelists who, uh, who led many uh, to Christ. And it was just a Sunday school teacher, you know, who uh, you know, stepped out of his uh, comfort zone um, you know, who mustered up the courage, went up to the place where he was working during the weekday uh, just to share about salvation. So he was so burdened about uh, the children in his class knowing Jesus Christ and accepting and them uh, accepting him as their Lord and uh, Savior. So we see that, yeah, it takes great courage uh, to win souls, but, you know, we know that it's not uh, how creative we are, uh, how well we speak, how good we are, but it's basically the work and the power of the Holy Spirit will be manifested in us, even as we have this deep burning desire to see people in our church, in our family, in our neighborhood, uh, the children that we are ministering to uh, be saved. Okay? Uh, if not, we will, you know, they will be in uh, eternal hell, uh, which is going to break the very heart of God, and even as uh, God is so burdened about lost souls, uh, you know, I hope that even as we minister, whether it's children or church or you know, they're an evangelist or they are uh, youth or working with women, uh, whatever group, you know, let's just have this great burden in our heart to see the people that we're ministering to accept Jesus as their personal uh, savior. So the teacher's objective is to give every child an opportunity to lead them into the assurance of salvation and to build in them uh, the things of God, or to build in them faith, uh, to build in them the confidence to step out in faith and uh, you know do um, flow in the gifts of the Spirit and do my desires and works. Okay, that's the end of today's class. Um, uh, tomorrow's class, uh, we will look at uh, the methods. Um, so we look at the messenger, we look at the method, how to prepare a lesson plan and how to go about it. Okay. Any questions? No questions? 
Okay, there are no questions. Thank you all for joining class, and I will see you uh, tomorrow for class. Have a good day. God bless you. See you.